Good afternoon. It's great to welcome so many of you to today's BHF Live and Ticking event. My name is Dr Charmaine Griffiths and it's my great privilege to be the Chief Executive of the BHF. And I'm so delighted you found the time to join us and I hope that this finds you well. I know you joined us today to hear more about the amazing research that the BHF is funding and I'm delighted to be joined by two absolutely brilliant speakers who I know you're going to enjoy listening to who will bring that to life for us all. And the first is my colleague and uh, our Associate Medical Director at the British Heart Foundation, Dr, Dr. Sonia Babu Narayan, who will talk about our research position during the COVID-19 pandemic. And the second is one of our amazing researchers, um, BHF Professor and Consultant Cardiologist at the University of Edinburgh, Mark Dweck, whose recent discoveries um, you'll hear about will uh, potentially lead to better treatments for people with COVID-19 and heart problems. So we've got about an hour together this afternoon and we're going to aim to have around 15 minutes or so for questions and also we're going to record this event um, and we'll be responding to your questions many of which you've sent in advance so thank you for those we've really enjoyed thinking about them and also invite you to submit your questions during this session and we will get back to you so this is the second in the series of our live and ticking bhf events and we absolutely loved from hearing everybody who joined our first session and do encourage you to kind of give us some feedback, which I'll come back to in a little while. But before we dive in, let me set the scene for you um, and share a few things about the British Heart Foundation. So we know many of you are supporters of the BHF or have been in contact with us for many years, and it's just brilliant to be with you today. And you'll know that for over 60, or excuse me, nearly 60 years, the British Heart Foundation has been a global leader in funding heart and circulatory disease research. And that's helped save hundreds of thousands of lives. And that's from proving the life-saving benefits of statins to discovering the genetic faults that cause um, heart conditions. And we're really proud of our BHF researchers and all of their achievements. But today you'll hear more about something more close to home for us all today, and that's around the COVID-19 pandemic, and also how BHF research is making a real impact in response to this health crisis. But there's no doubt, in addition to being a health crisis, that COVID-19 has also been the greatest financial challenge that the British Heart Foundation has faced in our 60 year history. And at this time, our BHF team and our researchers and others are working so hard at a time when our mission is under threat, which is why your support and donations from people around the country are absolutely vital at this time. We've been absolutely overwhelmed and are so thankful for those people who are supporting us in so many ways and so touched by people's efforts in support of our research at this time. And to name just a few examples, I'm going to start with a personal hero of mine, the 104 year old Joan Willett, a remarkable lady who walked up and down a hill outside her care home outside Hastings um, so many times in advance of her 104th birthday this, this summer and uh, raised a staggering £51,000 to support our BHF research. So a huge thank you to Joan, a huge personal hero of mine. And also thank you to the thousands of people, and um, you may be one of them, who engraved uh, your name or the name of a loved one on our Heart of Steel sculpture. And it has now raised over a million pounds to support our amazing and life-saving work. So huge thanks. And if you're interested in joining in that amazing artwork, as well as tribute, then um, please check that out on our website. And lastly, if you're a footy fan, and I have to confess I'm not, there's also coming up a really good way to get involved. And I'm going to try my best, even though I, I'm not a footy fan. We've got um, a football quiz launching in September, hosted by England legends, Glenn Hoddle and David Seaman. We're going to host a special live quiz for us, um, streamed online. And that's on Thursday, the 10th of September. So if you're up for that, please do check that out on our website to register as well. So we know that this afternoon we've got many friends of the BHF joining us from all over the country and my personal thanks to you for joining us and for your support. And we know that people are interested in hearing from our scientists, which I'm going to get to uh, pretty quickly, but also because we've got a range of people, we've asked our scientists to keep the level of discussion um, accessible to everybody. So I hope you find that and welcome hearing how that goes for you. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to the first of our speakers, my colleague Sonia. You're on mute, Sonia. Well, that was a good start. I was just saying <laughs> what a privilege it was to talk to you all today. 
Um, I cannot emphasize enough how much cardiovascular health is at the center of this global pandemic. At BHF, we recognize that immediately in the important job we had to do. It's making our BHF research more vital than ever if we to keep pace in redressing these killers and lead to a future with ever better prevention, diagnosis and treatment for heart and circulatory disease. But it's also affecting our community of people with heart and circulatory disease and their relatives and friends. And they needed information at this time. They still need information they can trust, which is something we also really recognised very early. I'm going to outline four reasons to explain why I feel I can genuinely say that cardiovascular health is at the heart of this pandemic. So first, we know that very sadly, a lot of people have died and each of these people have lost a life and have a family that are bereaving them. They're not just the numbers and graphs that we see on the statistics. When we do look at those numbers and those statistics, we see that the most common underlying conditions for those people who have had serious COVID-19 illness, been in intensive care, been ventilated, or amongst those who have died, have been heart and circulatory conditions. It could never be more relevant, the work we do, to avoid heart and circulatory disease and get better treatments for it. But we also need to understand these risk factors and heart and circulatory disease and why it causes severe COVID disease even better, so we can even better support people during the illness and manage individual risks. Second, we've all been hearing in the news and on those briefings, haven't we, about this thing, excess deaths. What, what is everyone talking about? Another way of understanding the effect of the pandemic is to look at how many people have died in, say, a given month and compare it to the average that we might expect to die in the UK in that same given month, a year or in the five years before. And we've seen very, very clearly during the course of this pandemic that there has been an excess mortality not explained fully by this COVID-19 illness and coronavirus infection. Some of this excess death is unfortunately also our community of heart and circulatory patients. We can't accept an environment where the peri-pandemic effects affect our patients in that manner. We need to do more and say more about it and learn more from our research. Third, as the negative effects of the economy, and we've all heard about that too in the last weeks, um, take hold. This could exacerbate the existing health inequalities we see. We're very aware of these at the BHF and we do a lot of work around trying to call those out and to manage them. Things like obesity are not simplistic and just up to individuals. It's about our environment. Things like coronary artery disease and hypertension. So we don't want to see an exacerbation of those existing healthcare inequalities, especially as relevant to heart disease, circulatory disease and its risk factors. Finally, I want to talk about the fact that heart and circulatory problems have been identified in people who are experiencing COVID-19 illness. And Mark Dweck, Professor Mark Dweck, who's going to speak to you next, will talk to you more about some of the work he's done in that arena. It seems COVID-19 is clotty. Clots can that block your blood vessels can damage your lungs, clearly we understand that in COVID-19, your kidneys, there's been a lot of kidney failure for some unlucky people. But if that clot is in one of the vessels in your brain, it causes a stroke or other neurological injury. And if it reaches your coronary artery, it causes a heart attack. We know that people who have the severe form of COVID-19 illness have a huge inflammation that affects their whole body, and this affects their heart too. We can see that from measuring markers of heart muscle damage in the blood. And we know that people who've had release of heart muscle um, of these markers in their blood are much more likely to have a very severe infection. There's also the chance of having an inflammation of your heart itself. People are still arguing of whether COVID-19 truly gives you the traditional definition of myocarditis, but either way, it can cause effects on the heart. So for patients in hospital, we don't know whether all of the patients had complications of COVID that resulted in heart disease or some were having newly diagnosed heart disease since I've already explained that having heart disease can result in a more severe COVID-19 illness and a chance of needing hospital. Regardless, we need to understand this so much better if we're going to get the right treatment to the right person at the right time in the right place. This is still a new disease and in a way there's also been an information pandemic, hasn't there? 
And as that new information keeps rapidly emerging, how do we know who to trust and which voice can help us navigate it? We at BHF responded to what was a very obvious and immediate need for consistent, medically literate and scientifically credible information for people with heart and circulatory disease or those who care about them. So how did we do that? To make sure that the BHF could provide a balanced, evidence-based and up-to-date voice to you, we used our cross-disciplinary expertise in-house, but we also worked really closely with external experts, for example, the clinical leads at NHS England and Improvement and at the British Cardiovascular Society and our wider medical and allied health professional networks. We needed to do that to support our heart nurses dealing with inevitably more emails and telephone helpline queries. And with Charmaine's support, that, that heart line was extended and expanded so that people could get through. We knew they would need more help. And indeed, many, many more phone calls were received at one time, 400 times more than usual. And it's not only phone calls, it's emails and specific queries and scientific queries. We also surveyed those of you with heart and circulatory disease out there to know what you needed and what your questions were so we could properly advocate for you. To ensure that that voice is trustworthy, we screen the scientific literature literally every day. We check all the government guidance, all the health and care services guidance, and we systematically work out how to synthesize that and ensure that we can express that in a meaningful way to you. We created a coronavirus hub on our website. I hope some of you will see that if you haven't seen it already. It must be doing something right, because to date we've had two million unique user reviews. So two million different people have looked at that. And we know that colleagues in the NHS and medical colleagues of mine, I know, and my nursing colleagues signpost to this regularly and use it every day in their clinics because it's considered helpful. What does it contain? It contains the answers to the frequently asked questions we receive from people like you. You might also find topical longer reads based on what's been in the news or what's been worrying people on social media. And sometimes we notice our behind the headlines articles are particularly popular. Sometimes the headlines take good research, but perhaps um, present it in a somewhat disproportionate way. And that can be really alarming for our community. And we need a way to express how to read um, what, what a more sensible viewpoint might be. I think BHF saved lives during these weeks. In March, we reported a drop in the number of people attending accident and emergency for symptoms that could be a heart attack. We also knew from our global colleagues that this had started to happen in other countries and we were alert to it. And we know from decades of research, much of which is BHF funded, that you, there are really good evidence based treatments for heart attacks in the UK people survive heart attack if they get the right treatment quickly. So we work together with the NHS to campaign to make really clear to people what the heart attack symptoms are and why you need to call 999 because the NHS was ready and waiting to see you. I cannot tell you how disappointed my cardiologist colleagues are that their numbers went down and they couldn't treat patients they know how to treat. We're here to help you and we need to continue to make that message super clear. And we're now pushing further to restore your heart services to make sure patients who need treatment now get it now and everybody has access. But we're here at BHF to fund research and make the future better, not only the present. Our current research budget has been cut from £100 million to £50 million. This is a shattering blow to our mission to beat heartbreak forever and to ensure that hearts are beating and bloods are flowing as best as they can. To, we need to fund the best science. Never has funding science to save lives been more important. I think we've all understood the importance of science in an especially clear way, as we've understood um, how we've had to be led by the science and how we all want to see new treatments for COVID-19. But our BHF funded research has had to stop abruptly and to restart and to restore the pace of our progress will cost millions of extra funding Funding we need now if we're going to ensure that we don't lose all the investments we've made in the previous 60 years. We have a very large portfolio of research, 800 projects, 1700 research staff, 400 PhD students who could be the future pioneers. Um, we mustn't lose a generation of talent and a generation able to make discoveries to change the future for our children in terms of heart and circulatory disease. So meanwhile, while all of this has been going on, we have not forgot our mission and our research. 
we've used the lesser money we have to plan with to make sure that people we already support and particularly fellows like Professor Dweck, who we'll talk to shortly, are supported, that we transition them through this period. We supported our researchers if they were redeployed to NHS care. We're very proud to support the NHS and proud that they're BHF. Sometimes that wasn't just clinicians, that could be people who work in labs who were redeployed to do testing to support COVID-19 testing. We also want our trials to continue and we know they've necessarily had to halt because the NHS couldn't accommodate them in a socially distanced way right now, but we're funding salaries of people we already fund until they can restart and we're doing our best. We haven't stopped funding different types of new research, but if we have less cloth to cut, we're going to need your help in order to get back to where we were and increase the pace of progress again. All the research BHF funds is towards the development of better diagnoses, treatments and prevention if it's successful. So I leave that with you that science saves lives and you can trust us at BHF to get it right. Over the last 60 years, again and again and again, the BHF has funded the right research that, that has resulted in life-saving treatments and improvements for those living with heart and circulatory disease. Given what we've achieved so far in 60 years, one can only begin to imagine what's possible in the next decades and decades to come. I want us to still be here for my children and our grandchildren and our great grandchildren. We mustn't not pause, we must keep the pace. We're now going to hear specifically about some examples of the groundbreaking research BHF allowed our researchers to support. We allowed our researchers to change their course and to do COVID-19 related research if they were funded by BHF at this time where that was a priority for so many people and in the UK. And despite the challenges of the pandemic, many of them delivered research. You will know that we have research funded around the whole of the UK in BHF centres of research excellence and from PhD students to professors. We also worked historically and before the coronavirus with the NIHR who have research throughout England, including in cardiovascular. And at this time, we also worked with our BHF NIHR colleagues to see how we could support the UK research community working together to tackle COVID-19. And I may come back to that later or Mark may. Meanwhile, let's hear about his groundbreaking research that he's managed to and what he's managed to achieve despite the current challenges. I'll pass over to Professor Mark Dweck. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Sonia. And um, first of all, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for, for having me. So um, my name is Mark Dweck. I'm uh, an academic cardiologist in Edinburgh. Uh, what does that mean? Well, basically it means that I spend half of my time looking after cardiology patients uh, in the wards, in the clinics, and half of my time uh, doing research. And the research that I'm particularly interested in and the research that the British Heart Foundation uh, funds me to do is uh, around ways of imaging the heart taking pictures of the heart, if you like, and trying to use uh, new methods of, of doing that to better understand how heart disease develops, uh, uh, get new ways to diagnose heart disease and develop new strategies to uh, treat heart disease more effectively and in a more patient centred and specific manner. So um, I've been doing that over the last 10, 15 years. And actually, we now have lots and lots of different ways of imaging the heart and we can get very beautiful pictures of the heart that can give us lots of different information. We can use CT scanners, we can use MRI scanners, we can use PET scanners. And if we put all of these techniques together, we can really get a better understanding of how the heart gets affected by different disease states and also more efficient ways of treating it. So uh, that's my interest. That's what I like to do. Um, and I guess when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, um, I actually got redeployed uh, into the NHS to work full time in the in the COVID wards, looking after COVID patients. And it quickly became apparent uh, to me and, and my colleagues that, that this uh, disease, this infection can affect the heart. We were being asked to review patients all around the hospital who had COVID-19 uh, infection and were having heart problems. And so we wanted to get a handle on that really uh, quickly, uh, really at the peak of the pandemic in the UK, we wanted to understand, okay, how is 
COVID-19 affecting the heart. And of course, this is a new infection. We don't, we didn't have any answers to this. This is a brand new problem that we have to really uh, work hard to understand. So we thought, well, what's the best way of doing this? And, uh, and what's the best imaging technique that we can do to look at the heart of these patients with COVID-19 infection? And the obvious answer actually is ultrasound. So this is a, a very simple test. Um, it's a handheld probe. We can take it to the patient's bedside. We can do a scan in 10 or 15 minutes. It doesn't hurt. There's no radiation. It's a very simple and widely used test all around the world. It's a bit like the scan that pregnant mothers have when they're looking at their new babies. It's that same technology, but instead we're using it to look at the heart. And so what we wanted to do is as quickly as possible, we wanted to gather as many of these the results for as many of these echo scans, ultrasound scans as we could all around the world from as many patients with COVID-19 as we could find. And to do this, we set up uh, an online platform. And I think actually one of the, the main things that this research has taught me is how powerful uh, the smartphone and the internet is in collecting research data very quickly. So we, we essentially set up a, a questionnaire, a survey that doctors and technicians could use uh, to, and fill out once they'd done an echo scan on a patient with COVID-19. So the idea was that someone would do this echo scan, it was indicated on clinical grounds, and then they would upload the results of that scan, uh, anonymized, to our uh, website, and therefore we could collect data, uh, hopefully rapidly and quickly from all around the world uh, to get a picture of how uh, COVID-19 was affecting the heart. And so that's exactly what we did. And we had a really amazing response. We collected uh, results from over 1200 scans from all around the world, 69 different countries, uh, all five, five continents, uh, all replying to our um, request for help uh, over a period of weeks. It was a really unprecedented uh, response. And um, we spent some time then trying to look at the, the data and work out, OK, how does this uh, infection affect the heart. So basically to summarize the results, um, we got data from over 1200 patients, as I said, and um, these were a specific group of patients. This is not all comers with COVID-19 infection. And this is really important to understand at the outset. These are patients who were very sick with COVID-19 infection, so sick that they had to come to hospital and then there was some reason, for some reason, the doctors got a heart scan. So there was some suspicion that maybe the heart was involved. And if we understand that, then I think we can interpret the data uh, properly. And what we found was that basically half of these patients who had a, a scan of their heart whilst they were in hospital for COVID-19, half of them had some sort of abnormality in the way that the heart was pumping. And one in seven of these patients, so quite a high proportion, had a severe abnormality. And most commonly that was either the left side or the right side of the heart was severely impaired in the way it was pumping. Now that's important because if you have severe impairment of the heart, that is likely to have a major influence on how you uh, cope with the disease, how you recover with, from the disease. Um, and so this is not just a benign uh, finding, this is an important finding. So the next thing we want to know, well, is this damage new or is this damage that has been there a long time? We, we've already heard uh, from Sonia that uh, lots of patients with established heart disease have problems with COVID-19 infection. So we excluded all the patients um, who had established heart disease. Anyone who had any history of heart disease were then excluded from the analysis. And what we found was that just under half the patients uh, in that group uh, had evidence of heart uh, dysfunction, um, an abnormality of the way the heart was pumping, and a, a slightly lower proportion, about one in seven or one in eight, had uh, severe uh, problems with the way the heart was pumping. And in that group, our presumption is that the, it's the virus that at least in a, in a proportion was causing this damage. This was a direct effect of, of the virus on, on the heart. So I think um, this data is, is important um, probably for two main reasons. So the first is that it tells us that, you know, COVID-19 is not just an infection of the lungs. I think we're understanding that more as we get more information about this new disease, that it can affect the brain, it can affect the kidneys, 
of course it can affect the lungs but crucially and in quite an important proportion of patients it can affect the heart so this is an important piece of knowledge as we move forward trying to work out how to combat this uh, unprecedented challenge and the second thing um, I think is actually good news and that is that we actually have extremely good treatments for for the heart we have excellent uh, drugs and therapies and devices for treating patients with heart failure for treating patients with inflammation of the heart for heart attacks for strokes all these things we're really good at it and I think the message to me was that we should think about the heart uh, when we think about or and see these sick patients in hospital and if we find uh, the heart damage that we saw in, in our study then we can do something about it and here's a great opportunity for us to get these patients uh, better more quickly out of hospital and you know back home um, so that's really the summary of the study um, there's probably lots of questions in and around that and I'm very happy to, to take questions from uh, from anyone on the panel or in uh, from the floor hi thank you Mark I know you'll join me in thanking Mark for um, such an inspiring presentation I think actually Sonia I'm gonna hand over to you guys to have a bit of a discussion and then we're gonna open it up to questions from the floor so over to you Sonia thanks um, I, I really enjoyed your talk Mark that was fantastic as always and um, I think it was really helpful how you've explained that COVID-19 is, is not just affecting people's lungs and that we're seeing heart abnormalities too in those patients that are seriously ill enough to need hospital. I thought it was also really interesting how you mentioned use of technology um, and how that expedited your research, which is a theme that perhaps we're all experiencing right now, right here. We're having a Teams meeting um, to discuss issues and you used apps to be able to work with your collaborators outside. Many, as both of us are cardiologists and we've um, had a very expedited change in our practice towards virtual clinics and telephone clinics. Things that for many patients, maybe not all, but for many patients are, are long awaited who don't want to make trek journeys to hospitals they don't need or always wanted their echo to be on the same day as their clinic. Um, so some of these changes have been very useful at BHF. We've um, been able to put out um, exercise videos and other products for mental health that mean people from their home can have got the much needed support they need for their cardiovascular health and mental health in this time period. Um, would you think you'd have been able to do this research without that technology? Yeah, um, I think, um, you know, that's a that's a great point uh, to pick up on, Sonia. I mean, um, to answer your, your question directly, uh, no, <laughs> the, uh, the the study uh, was completely reliant on uh, people having you know mobile phones and people um, being able to upload you know their data quickly. And we, we designed the study um, with you know that in mind. We wanted people to be able to complete the questions you know, within just a few minutes. We wanted to keep it simple because we didn't want to get in the way of the workflow of, you know, the clinicians who were busy looking after people, often very sick, uh, in the middle of the pandemic. Um, and the other thing to say is that, you know, when we designed the study, um, you know, we wanted to make use of the echo scan scans that were being done on clinical grounds because uh, certainly when this study was done, there, there was a lot of concern about the availability of personal protective equipment and you know the initial idea was that we would just scan everybody who came into the hospital who had COVID-19 but quickly we realized that, that, that the research scans that weren't necessarily clinically indicated we'd be using up all the PPE that you know should be going to all the frontline people actually delivering clinical care uh, so we moved away from that idea and, and you know instead wanted to make use of the scans that were be being done anyway um, and so yeah in short I you know, this design relied heavily on a the technology, but also, you know, I think the great uh, collaborative spirit that there is in the scientific community. I mean, um, both you and I, Sonia, have friends all around the world that we've you know got to know over the over the preceding years, research colleagues, clinical colleagues, and um, you know, it's really encouraging that when when you try and do a study and really understand better what's happening with the heart when COVID-19 all these people come together and you, 
you know, you pick up the phone, you say, can you help with the study? And you, I got nothing but positive responses. And um, I think that was a really positive thing about, about the study as well. I think it's a really important point, this spirit of scientific collaboration that we're seeing in the UK too. I mean, I think our medical director, Professor Sunilesh Samani, was really outstanding in his realisation that um, we had an opportunity to hear to work across the UK and with Charmaine's support convened very early the, um, the cardiovascular community across the UK to do research. There are some this was an amazing study, your study, because it was cross continent and in 50 or 60 countries. But we have other um, opportunities in the UK with our very large NHS population and our coordination. Um, those of you listening will know that we have NIHR, which um, funds infrastructures across the UK and has cardiovascular interest, but we at BHF fund, sorry, across England, we fund across the whole UK. Um, Mark is talking to you from Scotland, not England. And um, together, those infrastructures were able to, coming together could provide a lot of support and that was recognised. And so what was done is to convene all the stakeholders across the NHR cardiovascular field and the RBHF researchers like Mark and look at what we could do that no one could do um, as well and as quickly and as importantly as in the UK. And to date, several flagship NHR BHF funded study and um, BHF studies have been supported through that process and given a flagship status so that they can um, work together using their existing BHF and NHR um, structures. And I think that might be very relevant to where you may want to go next with some of your questions. Yeah, so um, right, I just make a quick point. I mean, the other thing to note is that, um, that the study has been ongoing and um, and really the, the contribution of the UK to this study has been outstanding. Um, you know, over well over a third of uh, the patients were were in the UK. So um, I think that speaks to the actually the long standing collaborative spirit that we have, uh, I think particularly in imaging research. And um, there's a long history of us all working together and combining data to produce really meaningful um, studies. So uh, long may that continue because, um, you know, particularly with a, a global challenge like COVID-19, you can't do something in a single centre. You have to be collaborative. You have to work together um, across the country and, and across uh, different countries too. So um, you, you mentioned imaging again and you mentioned in your talk that, you know, you one of your interests and of course, I share that, so I'm biased, is in state-of-the-art imaging. I mean, we can see the heart in ways we would never have dreamt of um, 50 years ago or 60 years ago when the VHF started. We can understand things in so much detail. Um, do you think that's been a, a unique opportunity somehow as all these different um, well, things clustered together in an urgent way? Yeah, I mean, I I think we're lucky. Um, we've got a real expertise in, in cardiovascular imaging in the UK. I mean, you could make a case that, you know, we're the world leader in doing this specific type of cardiovascular research. Um, and as I said, there's a collaborative spirit that um, that is established that makes studies like this quite easy to do because, you, you know, you can rely on your colleagues around the country supporting you in the same way that you would support them uh, in their research. And um, you know, I think that's a sort of virtuous cycle that um, that we're lucky to have, and we need to kind of foster and, and uh, keep keep doing. Um, and of course, we have lots of different imaging techniques, and I think the beauty of that is that you know you can pick the right technique to answer the question that you you want to to answer. So when we were trying to get a very quick snapshot of okay, how is the heart affected with COVID nineteen, we wanted it quickly and rapidly then ultrasound is by far and away the best technique to do that. But now I think the question is is different. The important question we need to answer is different. And there are probably two important questions. One is, what's the mechanism of this heart damage? You know, how does COVID-19 affect the heart? And, you know, you spoke about a couple of possibilities. One is, you know, heart attacks, regular heart attacks. The COVID makes you your blood more sticky and more likely to have heart attacks. Uh, you're more likely to have uh, emboli to the lungs and that might account for the uh, high proportion of the, the right side of the heart being affected. 
Um, but also it might be due to inflammation. You can get inflammation of the heart due to viral infections. You can get stress cardiomyopathies due to very severe illness. So there's lots of potential mechanisms for how the heart is involved in this in this disease. Um, and if we're going to really you know, understand how to treat it properly, we need to now dive into, OK, what's the exact mechanism for how COVID affects the heart? And then crucially, understand whether this damage that we saw and this severe damage that we saw in some patients, is, is that reversible or not? Is this is the start of you know, a, a lifetime of problems for these patients? I mean, we sincerely hope not. And I'm actually quite optimistic that a lot of this damage will be reversible. But we need to understand that because um, even if a small proportion of this damage is irreversible, that, that's a lot of patients that are going to have problems with their heart uh, in the long term due to the infection. So these are the key questions. And actually, ECHO is probably not the best technique to answer those questions. Uh, and, you know, MRI is probably the better technique. And, you know, this is a good opportunity to talk about the COVID heart uh, trial that has been funded as one of these flagship BHF NIHR studies. And this is led from uh, the group in Leeds, Professor Greenwood. Uh, we're taking part in Edinburgh alongside lots of other centres in the UK. And that's now to look at these patients who've had COVID-19 infection and to see with MRI where we can look really in detail at the heart muscle and work out exactly how the heart has been affected by the disease. And, and then in the long term, look to see whether this uh, damage is reversible or not. Absolutely. I mean, some of the way that BHF is supporting is through supporting within with our infrastructures, um, isn't it? Although many of these studies are going to be so large that other funders will also um, need to help. Um, I think it's really important to switch to Christy so that we can now hear from those that are listening, um, because I'm sure they're going to have so many better and more important questions for you. So I will go over to Christy. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia and Mark and Charmaine. Um, and to you all for joining us, we've had some fantastic questions through. So um, I'll be kicking off with a question uh, from our audience to Mark. So Mark, our question is, what are the health and disability impacts of COVID-19 on cardiac patients? I know you've touched on this, but if you could expand, the focus in the media is mortality, but what else are we seeing in those who survive the disease? Yeah, so, um... Well, you know, I think we need to understand, as I said, whether the heart damage seen in this in this study um, is reversible or not. Um, it's maybe a little bit early to give a complete answer to that. Um, I can speak anecdotally, and uh, and that is that you know, in the patients I see in the clinic, um, a lot of the people who had heart damage at the time of their admission with COVID-19 are now fine that most of those symptoms have have gone and they're feeling uh, feeling well, their heart looks back to normal. Um, there are some patients, however, that um, seem to be having longer term problems with the heart. Um, I've seen quite a lot of patients who um, have uh, had problems with palpitations, their heart uh, racing in their chest. Uh, this seems to, to follow uh, COVID-19 infection. We need to understand this much better. Um, it's not clear whether that's due to the infection or whether that's just the development of palpitations as a, as a different uh, disease. Um, and, you know, I think that's now our focus as, as you know, the, the full, the peak of the wave has passed. You know, what we really need to start thinking about are the longer term consequences of COVID-19 uh, on the heart, um, as well as all the other organs, because if you're a heart patient and then suddenly you have a nasty infections, you know, that, that's not going to make you feel well. So um, I think this is the next key phase of, of the research to really delve into that and to understand it better. Thank you, Mark. Our next question is for Sonia. And the question is, is the coronavirus gender biased? Well, how rarely would I ever be able to say that as a woman, I might actually be at some advantage in any category for anything. And perhaps the COVID virus is a bit gender biased. It doesn't seem to be great to be a man right now for that particular virus. This doesn't mean that the rest of us are fine and we don't have to socially distance because they're women, not at all. But when we look at population statistics, it's been quite clear that 
being a man seems to be a risk factor and that's regardless of age group that's across all the age groups as you know it a more serious illness becomes um, more likely in older patients but even in younger people um, men seem to have a more um, severe illness than women and, and it's still uncertain exactly why this is it's one of many research questions that might help us answer better what we can do about things it may not be simply biological there are behavioral differences in men and women and certainly early in the pandemic with the data from Wuhan there was quite a lot of speculation that it was because in um, of differences in how whether what men and women smoke and that men are more likely to smoke there was some now um, I think clearly not the case though well, wrongly people suggested smoking might even protect you at one point we know that's clearly not the case it's never a better time to give up smoking for those of you for whom that's relevant some people have speculated about genetic differences between men and women and the immune system um, or whether female sex hormones have a different role in fighting off certain kinds of respiratory infections we also know that in the UK men may be more likely to have other comorbidities or under other underlying conditions that we also know put you at risk so the why is not an easy question but the answer to the question about what is COVID-19 biased is perhaps an easy yes um, it doesn't like men and it doesn't like men more than it doesn't like women thanks Sonia uh, and another question for you Sonia uh, are the BHF going to fund any new projects that specifically look at COVID-19 and cardiovascular health so all our grant all our ways of funding um, research are open at the moment so um, we have different ways researchers can apply for money they can apply for their for a fellowship because we're funding individuals or for a project or a program of wider research or a clinical trial where you might give half a group of treatment and not the other half and see what works and all of these streams are open so if a compelling project comes in that is on COVID-19 and is a competitive that will be chosen and that could be funded. Meanwhile, we saw that that might not be the best and quickest way to address the earlier kinds of research. And that's why we worked hard to put in place a system to set up projects that were collaborative. And that's why we keep mentioning the NHR BHF um, flagships, because right now for the sort of more acute projects that has been very helpful, but those will also look at the long term complications. So, um, I'm glad Mark mentioned that we think some, we don't know which of the heart disease that's diagnosed during COVID is reversible. That will be the kind of question that those projects and future projects would want to answer. So in essence, there hasn't been a specific and separate call for COVID-19 research. We did think about that very hard. We even designed one, but we knew we could do even more, even faster, which has proven to be the case by galvanising in a way that only BHF perhaps can do, convening and galvanising the UK research community to work together and our existing streams remain open for future projects. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, we also have a, a question for you, Sonia. So what will research on COVID-19 and heart disease look like in the near future? What big questions do we need answers for? I think we've talked a little bit about the cardiovascular complication questions so of course we need that answer I think we also need to understand who is at risk if we have winter surge or second wave going forward I know that people need already and need to continue to work very hard to now with the information we have having had more experience of the virus um, how can we better determine who is at risk who needs to shield who needs to socially distance when the virus becomes more prevalent again and that isn't as easy as it sounds to do we can say blunt things like having heart disease is it was something that was a common underlying condition in those who had severe COVID-19 illness but which heart disease how severe with which treatment um, who is most at risk I think is and and therefore how we can treat it better I think some of the other kinds of research not only about the complications of the virus but the that in people who have COVID-19 illness in hospital but what about these effects of the pandemic that I alluded to earlier that there have been excess deaths we know that in the UK it's still true that over 40 percent of people who die at the moment have heart um, or circulatory disease that's regardless of whether you died 
from COVID-19 in the last 12 weeks or whether you didn't have COVID-19 at all. So understanding there may be kinds of research to understand what is mediating that and how we can use that knowledge to reprioritize and appropriately prioritize heart and circulatory patients to get the care they need and avoid more deaths from non-COVID related re reasons or, or from heart disease that could have been very well treated if it had been seen in more usual ways. So those are just a couple of examples, but I think we'll also be learning new questions as we go along. Because as you know, research stands on the shoulders of previous research and often um, creates the correct questions that could later lead to treatments that save and improve lives. Great, thank you, Sonia. We have a question for Mark, which is, has come through. Um, hi, Zena. Zena says, thanks, Mark, for your excellent presentation. Really enjoyed it. Given that research has now moved on due to the pandemic and that studies are happening faster with greater use of technologies, is it reasonable to presume that we don't return to some of the more sedentary or slower ways of research continuing so that we can build upon the advances that have been made during the pandemic? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the pandemic has changed everything, hasn't it? Uh, you know, Sonia was talking earlier about how it's changed how we look after patients and, um, and you know, we, we're using video teleconferencing, just simple telephone calls a lot more frequently than we did. And I'm not, I think we're going to keep doing that because it seems very efficient for if we pick the right patients. Uh, and similarly in research, you know, we've we need to be quick on our feet. We need to move uh, fast and understand COVID-19, but also heart disease generally, you know, quickly. And, and the quicker we can do that, uh, the better. But um, having said that, we need to make sure that we don't take shortcuts um, because we need to make sure that, you know, that what we're, the conclusions we come to with the research that we do is are correct. And uh, I think particularly when we're talking about therapies, then you know, this idea of the randomized controlled trial uh, that's been talked about a lot, but this is really the gold standard way of understanding for sure whether treatments actually work or not. And trying to draw conclusions from trials that aren't randomized controlled trials is very difficult. And I think it's amazing, actually, the randomized controlled trials that have been, are being done in the UK, you know, world leading in this area in terms of finding new treatments and working out which treatments work. And it's been very impressive how um, these trials have been set up, testing multiple different uh, potential treatments at the same time in thousands of patients all across the country. And I think from a cardiology point of view, we should look at those trials quite carefully and see, can we do something similar in cardiovascular disease? Can we pick a disease that we don't have a, a, you know, a therapy for and really roll out a kind of widespread randomized controlled trial uh, to get a quick solution to um to that problem so you know i think that's very exciting actually if you're interested in doing clinical trials designing these these trials that can move quickly all across the country i think that's definitely the future and covid19 has really kind of uh emphasized that to all the people you know in the field trying to design new ways of of treating heart disease thank you mark our next question is for sonia is there any reason why someone with cardiovascular disease shouldn't take part in a vaccine trial? Um, I think that's a good question related to what we've just been talking about in a way, isn't it? So it's not only vaccines, it's there are repurposed drugs being considered that might be very helpful for COVID-19. Every trial has a criteria for who they're trying to recruit and at what stage of the trial. Certainly in the long run, um, we will want there to be representation of people with cardiovascular disease participating in trials, but it might be that the particular trial you're interested at this time point um, is looking for people at very high risk of getting COVID-19, for example, key workers. So I know one of the Oxford vaccine trials, when I looked at the eligibility criteria, is looking for key workers right now, but in the future might be looking for wider scope. So firstly, I can't answer for an individual trial because I would need to know the eligibility criteria and, the tri and one would need to contact the trial organisers. But I can say that it's really good to hear the question, that there's enthusiasm to know about that and to want to take part. We need our trials to be representative, to, to include women and men, to include people from every background. And because COVID-19 affects cardiovascular disease, no doubt we need to know this vaccine 
works for these for our patients and that they get them as a priority they get opportunity to be in these trials as a priority one could argue so i can't answer for an individual whether they're eligible for a particular trial at this point but in principle um i think people will be eligible for trials at some point thank you sonia we have uh, one more question for you, Sonia, and then a couple for Charmaine. Um, so, Sonia, has the British Heart Foundation done any research into the impact of COVID-19 on children with cardiac disease? So one small point on the previous, just before I forget, some drugs that are being trialled um, for treatment of coronavirus have cardiovascular complications like rhythm disturbance or aren't suitable for heart patients. So that's just an example of why it's hard to answer that question for all types of heart patients and all types of trials. Um, so yes, there are some, there is some research that has gone on for COVID-19 in children. There are two aspects of that. We know that people under 18, under 30, under 45, depends where you choose your comfort, for your cuts off seem to be at very, 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 very low risk of um, severe COVID-19 illness and many children probably have no symptoms at all. We all, and we know that because there has been some research trying to collect data on children and adults of so a sort of general population kind. There's also been questions to BHF about children who already have heart disease. How much risk are they at? And that's quite difficult because some of that early data is really in adults, mainly with heart attack disease. So how do we understand it for your, my child with heart disease and what they should do about school and shielding and so on? I can, reassuringly, the all the data to date is quite reassuring about congenital heart disease, for example. It doesn't seem to be children be the case that children with congenital heart disease necessarily have a severe COVID-19 illness. They seem to be more protected by being young than the fact they have an underlying heart condition. We might not be able to say the same quite as confidently in adults. There is a very rare condition that has also been that research has also described, and you may have heard of, which is the multi-system inflammatory syndrome associated with COVID-19 that um, some children have had, which has necessitated admission to hospital and sometimes intensive care. Many children still do well um, if they get that illness and that has frightened many, many people. What I can say is it's very, very, very rare. And for most, for, um, there are always rare diseases and always rare things that go on even without a COVID-19 pandemic. And I think we shouldn't need to be too worried about that particular one because globally everyone agrees it's rare and again it hasn't been something especially predicted by having an underlying heart and circulatory condition it's happened to all, all kinds of children thank you sonia that's that's great uh, a question for Charmaine. Uh, thank you Charmaine so what new fundraising initiatives are uh, you looking at to raise funds for the BHF at this time Great question, thank you. Um, so I've already mentioned some fabulous ideas coming from the teams. So you've heard about the footy quiz that's happening in September. So if you're a fan of football or your, your family and friends are, then please do get involved. But we've also got lots of ways um, that you can find out about on our website to support the amazing uh, um, work that you've heard about today and much more through fundraising activity. We've got lovely things like my, my cycle, my step, if you're a cyclist or a walker, so ways in which you can raise personal funds or indeed in a ways in which you can celebrate or indeed remember loved ones um, such as the Heart of Steel. Um, it's also been so inspiring to me personally to see so many people do their own thing. Um, I mentioned Joan, the 104 year old who walked up and down the hill outside her care home in Hastings for so many days to raise over £50,000, just incredible. But she's just one example of so many beautiful ways and inspiring ways in which our supporters are coming together to support us at a time when we need them more than ever. It's also worth remembering if you're like me and you've had a deep clutter through the lockdown, um, our BHF shops and stores are now open uh, on high streets across the country. So please do take in um, your much needed donations to help us kind of raise uh, vital funds for our research. There's one other thing I'd like to share with you, which is also that um, to recognise this issue is much bigger. So the financial crisis we face is much bigger than BHF alone. And I'm really proud that we're standing side by side with over 150 charities across the UK to urge the government to support research 
uh, funded by charities in order to protect the progress that Sonia and Mark and many others have, uh, are working on and have described today and elsewhere. So we're urging the government to set up a charity life sciences partnership fund to help match the funds raised by charity at this time of financial crisis in order to help us weather the kind of challenge together. Because as Sonia has described, once our research pipeline is damaged and we lose talent and we lose momentum on our pro uh, projects and programmes, we lose the progress towards discoveries and treatments that patients urgently need. So that's one other way in which we as a BHF are standing united with other charities and other partners asking government to support research at a time when it's never more needed. Thank you, Charmaine. And a follow on question um, from what you've touched on. What does the future look like for the BHF? So BHF is a very special place, as, as you guys will know, it's a very special organisation that's touched so many people um, across the UK. And we're really proud of our BHF team, our colleagues, our volunteers, and we're super thankful for, for so many of our supporters whom we rely on and whom we simply couldn't do the work we do without. So um, there's no doubt that the coronavirus um, pandemic has not only been a health crisis in the way you've heard Mark so inspiringly and Sonia so eloquently talk about, but it's also been, of course, a financial crisis. And I'm really proud of the way that the British Heart Foundation has responded in offering hope and help to people who need us most through our coronavirus um, hub by allowing researchers to either return to the front line when they wanted and needed to, or indeed to redeploy their research towards um, COVID-19 and its effects on heart and circulatory disease, as you've heard today. I think it's just been phenomenal to see how the organisations responded. There's no doubt, as you've heard, it's the biggest single challenge we face financially. Our net income is down by around 50% this year, and we anticipate our, our research funding and investment budget in new research fund falling by about 50 million pounds. And it's going to take a lot to kind of fight back against that. But we have an extraordinary team. We have an extraordinary organisation and extraordinary supporters. And by working together, I know that we'll get through this challenge for, for the next 60 years and beyond. So um, it is a big and extraordinary challenge. We need your support and that of many others uh, across the UK. So anything you can do is wonderful, but we will get through this by working together. Thank you. So I think, Christy, was that the last of the questions or any more? Or, um... Yes, that was. That's all we have time for today. Thank you. So I might just finish by thanking you actually for joining us. Um, I've loved hearing the questions. We always do. It makes these sessions so much uh, so much more vibrant to hear your questions live. So thank you for joining us and, and joining in as well. And I know that you'll um, join me in thanking Mark for such an inspiring presentation. So thank you, Mark. It's just brilliant to hear about your research, but also about your return to the front line and also the scale of international response that you had and how you use tech and and uh, some of the technology existing and smartphone tech to kind of work things out. So just really inspiring and thank you for joining us today. It's we're really proud to have you as part of our BHF team. And Sonia, um, brilliant and great to hear you give an overview of our BHF response. And like you, super proud of the way that we're using our research to uh, funding both to support research, but also using the BHF network to convene people and bring people together around solutions. I think that's um, something we're all incredibly proud of. So lastly, from me, if um, you or someone you know uh, could benefit from a bit more information, do check out our coronavirus hub on our website. It's filled, as Sonia described, with brilliant health advice and support. And there's details of our heart helpline there, manned by specialist cardiac nurses. So that's there to support you and your family and loved ones. Please do go and check that out as well. And lastly, um, please do visit our website if you're interested in supporting us in any way. There are, whatever you're into, football, cycling, walking, other, there's something for everybody. So please do check that out. My last request would be you're probably going to get an email from us asking a few questions about what you enjoyed about this event and how you might help us make them better for the future. And your support in kind of filling that in and telling us what you think would be hugely appreciated. And the next event, note it in your diary if you're interested, is the 23rd of September. Um, between three and four. So please do make a note. I really hope you join us again and invite your friends and family to do so as well if you think it will be of interest to them. And you can find out more at bhf.org.uk forward slash public events. So I really hope you've enjoyed uh, this afternoon's session as much as I have. Huge thanks to both Mark and Sonia and thank you very much for joining us and all of your support at BHF. We couldn't do what we do without you. So a huge thanks and take care.